So I want to talk with you today about security blankets, McDonald's, and dyslexia. And hopefully by the end of this talk, the linkages will all come together and make sense. The common thread here is comfort zone. Security blankets, pacifiers, stuffies, and comfort food are all on the go comfort zones. All of us have security objects, whether it's a baby lying in their parents' arms, or whether it's a literal security blanket, and in my case, an iPhone and laptop, and perhaps that's yours as well. In my case, with extra set of headsets and batteries. I once counted five headsets and three batteries in my bag. We all have our addiction to security objects. On my honeymoon many years ago, I wanted to take my work laptop. Everyone said it was a really bad idea. I took it anyway, and sure enough, a man falls on my laptop and literally crushed it and my comfort zone. I was instantly in tears. But like me, even at the risk of a honeymoon, we all like to stay in our security uh, comfort zone because it makes us feel safe and secure. But how important is it? A recent survey showed that 35% of the adults still carried around and slept with their stuffy. I think. I don't know how many of you do this, but so do security objects really work? Yes, our, our attachments are rational. So a study from 2000 showed that children who brought their security blankets to the doctor's visit showed less signs of distress, measured by heart rate and blood pressure. So security blankets really do live up to their name. But yet, why do we push our boundaries and step out of our comfort zone? This is because it helps us take risks and experience failure. And when we overcome that failure, it makes us be more confident and resilient. And expands our comfort zone so that we can be prepared for a next challenge. And what are the key ingredients for success? To succeed, we need to feel secure and supported and we need to feel that we have control over the situation. We need to feel that we can, uh, we can change with effort. And it's important to have a role model, ideally that someone is close to you, similar, and share the same experience. So for example, if a boy's climbing up a tree, they're more likely to do so if they saw a sibling do so, rather than a stranger. And we'll get back to the science of this later. I'll take now it is an example of public speaking. This is something that many of us feel it as out of our comfort zone. It is the most common form of social fear. Nearly 30% of us have this. And it interferes with our daily lives in 10% of us. And so it makes sense that this is the most common form to induce anxiety and stress in psychology research. So this is me back then, but I'll share my story. So I grew up having a fear for public speaking, and I still do. My nickname in elementary school was Fumiko the Blusher. I would even blush at the anticipation of the teacher calling me. And in medical school, there were group oral exams, and I would look down to avoid uh, eye contact with a professor. And what do professors do? They point at the person who's looking down. And so my strategy clearly didn't work back then. So as soon as I graduated from high school, I signed up to work at McDonald's. Not because of this uniform, it wasn't trendy back then, perhaps it's much better now, but because I wanted to overcome my social phobia. McDonald's accurately assessed my skills, and I got the job to polish brass railings. But eventually I moved up, and I ended up retiring from McDonald's as a cashier. So hooray, it was a success story. After I went to medical school, I became a psychiatrist because I was interested in brain, science, brain sciences, but also because I thought if I made talk in my profession, I might become a better communicator. So I finally started to get used to this and stepping out of my comfort zone, feeling comfortable when I started research. And you might think it's counterintuitive, and I thought so too initially because when we think about researchers, they usually stick their head down 
and crunch numbers, collect data, maybe with animal research, minimal human interactions. But I was wrong. When you have research findings, you have to go to conferences and you communicate with people all the time. So what I started, so at first, what I did was remembered every single word of my speech until it became so automatic that I would not remember a word I said during the talk, but only the burning sensation on my cheeks. And so recently I gave a talk at Oracle Park in San Francisco where my son came along and he said he wanted to give me feedback. And this is the feedback he gave me, unsolicited advice. Well-intentioned though. You droned too much, you said, I'm too much, you were too quiet, you didn't use enough gestures, but to my defense, I'm Japanese, so it's really hard to grow up using, uh, learn to use gestures, and that you sounded bored with only a hint of enthusiasm. <laughs> and he went through the trouble of adding only after the fact. But if you think I, do, I, I am giving a decent talk today, you are welcome to shoot an email to my son, DirkKaito at gmail.com. So, so far, I haven't said really anything new. I talked about how people love security objects and comfort food. I also talked about how many people have a fear for public speaking, and we all know this. You pro perhaps you learned something about myself, that I do have a fear for public speaking as well, and about my well-intentioned son. I want to switch over and talk about dyslexia. And why do I talk about dyslexia? First, because it is a topic that I do research in and it's near and dear to my heart, and I know a little bit about this, and also because I believe that there's many things we can learn from them. Individuals with dyslexia are constantly forced to step out of their comfort zone and work on crushing it. So dyslexia is a neurobiological condition where they have specific difficulties in learning to read, and they're very smart individuals. But because reading is so crucial to our modern society, even to this day, they often end up with poor outcome. Whether it's poor educational attainment, they have higher high school dropout rates, poor psychosocial adjustments, there's two to five times increase in the risk for anxiety, depression, suicide, and addiction, and poor health outcome and lower income. But if you thought this was bad enough, there's also a negative stereotype about dyslexia and learning differences. And here are some of the stereotypes, that they're inferior, they're failures, they're stupid, they're slow, and that they are cheating, that they're lazy, they're needy, and they take advantage of the educational system. So this further fuels their negative outcome and also isolates them and feels, makes them feel that they are rejected. But yet, many, so it's almost a miracle that many individuals with dyslexia or some individuals with dyslexia end up being very successful. Chuck Schwab, Jack Horner, Richard Branson, to name a few. And this got me really curious. How is it that those individuals with dyslexia or some individuals with dyslexia who are at succeeding end up succeeding? And it got me thinking, could it be because they crushed their comfort zone? So let's take Jack Horner as an example. He was severely dyslexic or is severely dyslexic. He claims that he still can't read. He graduated from high school with a D minus minus minus, and he failed college seven times, never graduated, and he had a GPA of 0.06. What is he like now? He's a professor of paleontology, the scientific advisor of all Jurassic Park and World movies, and also a MacArthur Genius Award winner. He also made remarkable discoveries. For example, he found that dinosaurs do indeed care for the young. He also theorized that if you take an egg and turned off some of the genes, that the adult chickens may have dinosaur-like features. And this was based on his observation that in the egg, the chickens possess some dinosaur-like characteristics that they gradually lose over time. Not sure if he succeeded, but I sure hope he's still working on this. So as you can see, or agree with me hopefully, that he's a remarkably creative and successful individual. So what does his story tell us? It tells me at least of his remarkable resilience. Oops, that was a chickenosaurus story. It tells me at least of his remarkable resilience 
And when you ask him how he succeeded and how he made it here, he often talks about his mother, his mother who was very understanding and supportive of him, that allowed him to pursue what he loved the most, which is to dig fossils. A couple years ago, I gave a TEDx talk on the yin yang of dyslexia. In that talk, I talked about some remarkably successful individuals with dyslexia, like Jack Horner. And I also talked about this study, how over a third of the individuals or entrepreneurs have dyslexia or poor reading. And this is quite striking when you think about the prevalence in the general population. In the general population, there's about 5 to 10% of the individuals are identified with dyslexia. So it's clearly overrepresented in entrepreneurs. Some have said that individuals with dyslexia are successful because they have this innate talent that they're born with gifts. While there's no concrete evidence to this date, it is possible when you think about how the brain is organized and develops. So the brain is like a seesaw. So if one part of the brain is weak, the reading network, then the surrounding area or the opposite hemisphere might become stronger. And this is what was the, claim, the basis of the claim for some individuals. We showed in a preliminary format several years ago that this might indeed be the case. So individuals who are poor readers, they tend to have better spatial abilities. And if you look at their brains, it paralleled that pattern. So we showed that there was a yin-yang or seesaw relationship between reading and spatial abilities. But as a scientist, I have to say we need more replication studies. And of course, we don't know the causal relationship. But it is an intriguing finding. But what I claim here in this talk is that individuals with dyslexia might be successful not because they have dyslexia and innate talent, but, be, but despite them having dyslexia. That they're constantly forced to face challenges, and by doing so, they overcome it and they become successful. And having resilience is key. So what's the re relationship between dyslexia and resilience? As I said, perhaps those individuals with dyslexia who have a good outcome are those individuals who can bounce back from adversities and have resilience. So we did some research and we found some important factors that were associated with this. We showed that growth mindset is important in promoting resilience and having a good outcome. And the brain network that is important for growth mindset is similar to the brain no network that's important for cognitive reappraisal, the glass half full mentality, and intrinsic motivation, the drive circuit. We also show that it's important to be determined. And the determination and the grit network, and grit is where we persist towards a long-term goal. And this network overlapped with the persistent network, not surprisingly, and also the network that was important when we're working towards a future reward. We also show that optimism is important, and it relates a little bit to the cognitive reappraisal that we just talked about. But there's a great TED talk by Tali Sharat. She's also a neuroscientist several years ago, so I highly recommend you watch this. And also the sense of control is very, very important. This middle frontal part of the brain called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, if you want to repeat after me, or VMPFC, is known to be important for regulating emotion and amygdala. And it's important when we're making our own choices and for the sense of control. And we, when we have a sense of control, we fail less. And even when we do fail, our VMPFC stays turned on and we can better regulate our emotions. This VMPFC region is also important for regulating the brainstem around our neck. And this is particularly important when we're gaining the sense of control over stressful experiences, known as stress controllability. And this helps us reduce anxiety and promote resilience. And finally, it is very important that we have the support from the family members, peers, and we have a strong sense of bonding with our peers. So research has shown that support and encouragement reduces anxiety and stress in children. And even in animal research, 
stress-free animals. I don't know if that exists, at least I don't think it exists in humans, but if you, not, if you don't have stress, their dopamine level is higher, and that they are more likely to take risks, work harder, and go for their high stakes rewards. But if you don't have innate resilience, and these factors that I just talked about, or if you don't have a mother like Jack Horner, or if you don't have a pacifier or security blanket that you can take with you everywhere, what can we do? One way is to find a mentor. Eye to Eye is a national mentor program for uh, high school and college age students with learning differences, dyslexia, and ADHD. And I'll call them LD students for now because it's a mouthful. But they mentor middle school LD students. This is called near mentoring. What we found was over the course of one year of mentoring, those who were mentored showed reduced depressive symptoms, increased self-esteem, and increased interpersonal relationships. They also were able to better regulate their emotions, feel comfortable with their identity, and had more growth mindset. And this is particularly remarkable when you think about the two comparison groups that we had. So one, two con comparison groups were those who were not mentored. One was the LD students who were not mentored, and the other one was non-LD students. And these individuals or students over the course of the year went down or worsened in many of these domains. Whereas those who were mentored not only stayed flat, but they actually increased and improved and got better. So there was a divergence over the course of the year. So what are mentors? They are our role models, and they give us a sense of control, they give us support, and they make us believe that we can change with effort. And this allows us to take risks and step out of our comfort zone. And when we do fail, it makes us perceive this failure as healthy stress and not toxic. And what I mean by this is that they are, the situation is escapable, they have control over it, and it's transient. And these are very important factors to become more confident, resilient, and crush that comfort zone and help us expand our comfort zones. So here's my advice to all of you with dyslexia, but it translates to all of us, and I think we can learn from this, that we need to step out of our comfort zone and crush it at times. And in order to do this successfully, we need to find a mentor, a role model, and someone who understands us. We need to believe in ourselves that we can change and that we have control over the situation. And that we need to take away that security blanket by ourselves and not let, it, let anyone else take it away from you because the sense of control is very important. And by, when we experience failure, we can become more resilient and confident and we can be ready for a next challenge, failure and success. But if we have a rough day, Regressing to your comfort zone is not all bad. Thank you.